fools fool you, so do you, and lose dudes that want you to lose, so X can use you as a stent, but they have been wrong. You are not divine, but just a skin tone. The Seth Rollins episode of Broken Skull Sessions was one of the better Broken Skull Sessions episodes, and I still had a difficult time finding things to talk about without doing a full review of the episode. I, I really don't like doing full reviews of these things. I like to try to push them towards a topic or two that I'm very interested in. And I think the best thing to, to discuss here with Seth Rollins is his evolution. You know, the... When he first came to WWE and where he is now. Before, um, in a previous video, I believe it might have been one of my SmackDown reviews or something like that. I talked about why Seth Rollins is one of the most hated guys like on the internet. As far as WWE superstars is concerned. And one of the things that I said is, I believe it was because Seth baptized himself in the WWE system. And I basically juxtaposed that between him and John Moxley slash Dean Ambrose by saying uh, Seth Rollins is a, more of a racehorse. You know, he can be trained. He's a he's a thoroughbred, while John Moxley is more of a zebra. He's more of a uh, you know, there's no such thing as a herd of zebra. You know, zebra get together as a way of camouflaging with other zebra, but mostly they just do their own thing. And that's really what a lot of people believe that wrestling should be is that, you know, there's the independent mindset, which is the stereotypical concept of the independent contractor that you don't work in one place, but that you float around. You just take your act and your abilities and you travel from place to place and you bounce around. Where in the WWE, there's a system, you know, there's a pipeline from where you were to where you are. And Seth Rollins kind of had that moment in this documentary or in this conversation where he talks about it, and I already knew about it because I heard about it when it occurred where he had his, uh, his, his moment where he was either going to be a zebra or he's going to be a racehorse, you know, where, you know, he got into it with Terry Taylor and this is where he got to NXT. So, but before we get there, it's important that we talk about his, uh, his evolution to that point, because, Seth Rollins is one of the most successful, quote unquote, indie guys in WWE history. As far as guys who came from like that Ring of Honor type of system that made it to WWE and had some long, some longevity in terms of success. It's him, it's Daniel Bryan, CM Punk to a degree. Those are like the three pillars of guys who came from Ring of Honor and really made it in the WWE. Uh, Kevin Owens, uh, you know, kind of, but. Those three are undeniable as far as three guys who won the big belt, who were recognized as the guy for a while. It's Seth Rollins, Brian Danielson, and CM Punk. And it's very interesting to watch because they all had that same situation where CM Punk is just like Mo John Moxley. He's more of a zebra. He wants to do his own thing. Where Brian Danielson and Seth Rollins were more racehorses. They wanted to do, they were willing to go into the system learn the system and try to succeed within it. And they ended up doing so. Um, so let's talk about his beginning. So they talked a lot about in the early part, cause if, just in case you didn't watch it in the early part, they talked about him being a dad. They also talked about, you know, the worst match of the year <laughs> with his match with the fiend. And Seth essentially put all that on Vince and said, that, Hey, if it went the way we wanted it to go, the match wouldn't have gotten uh, worse, worst match of the year. But Steve Austin and, and him, they both, they cheered and drank beer to both of them having the worst match of the year at one point. I thought it was a pretty cool segment as far as they, as far as they didn't take it personally. And they just kind of had a, had a little joke about it. But, um, Seth was very, said he was pretty upset with Vince over that match. Um, for good reason. <laughs> for good reason. But let's get into Seth Rollins and his, uh, his, his beginnings. Because I think this is very important to where I wanted to go as far as the indie mindset. Um, Seth Rollins, you know, started wrestling at 14, which of course is not a legal age. So that means that he was a backyard guy and he's basically told that, you know, the Foley, um, videos on WWE TV inspired a bunch of backyard wrestlers to which we have a lot of them in wrestling today. You know, a bunch of guys who, you know, with a trampoline or mattresses in their backyard 
thought that, hey, I can do this now. And Seth Rollins was one of those guys. And he saw about his parents getting a divorce. And in the divorce, they bought him a trampoline. So, you know, just to keep himself um, entertained. And that he learned how uh, wrestling, the secrets of wrestling, from the television show, the the expose on wrestling that came on, where it was like Magic Secrets Unleashed or something like that. And they did, they did do one on pro wrestling. I forget, maybe I should do a video on that one day. If I can find it online, I'll probably watch it and do a video on it. Um, but, you know, that's where he learned sort of the secrets of wrestling is from that. And he kind of incorporated that. And then he says kind of basically he became like one of the Hardy Boys. Like if you ever know the story of the Hardy Boys where they had their Omega Wrestling Company. And it was, you know, those two and their friends, again, being backyard again, um, doing stuff in their backyard. And Seth Rollins essentially said, yo, hey, that was me too. I was also a, a backyard again who had his own little wrestling promotion with me and my friends. And we were just learning how our bodies worked and how to control ourselves, jumping off, you know, jumping off things and jumping onto things. And it, it made sense. But he says that he's always one of those guys who felt like because he really wanted to be a wrestler, he needed to get properly trained. So then we go through the history of him trying to get trained, him going to the Ring of Honor Dojo, um, which was at the time being run by CM Punk, but he didn't have any money. <laughs> so they told him, uh, you can't, you can't train here for free. It's not going to happen. So he um, went and found, got himself a job and then started um, working with uh, Danny Daniels in Chicago. And from there, he followed Danny Daniels around, making the towns, you know, training on the job, essentially. And then he ended up in back in Ring of Honor, where, you know, it's kind of where he wanted to be, you know, and um, Full Impact Pro, which is another one. And um, And this is where we really get the indie mindset. Because he talked about being in Ring of Honor and being in Full Impact Pro and not being concerned with drawing money, but being concerned on what was cool, you know, and he was only making $150 a night. But, you know, this is where he was learning to do a lot of the stuff that he was doing, that he was, you know, inspired by CM Punk and AJ Styles and Hayabusa. And he took bits and pieces of from, you know, everybody and learning about, as he says, bodies in motion. And that's really what he focused on in Ring of Honor and Full Impact Pro and all the other independents that he worked in. And if you look at the independents today, that is what it is. You know, it's essentially bodies in motion. You know, it is guys doing what they think looks cool and sounds cool to do, even if it doesn't make any sense in the context of the match. From there, he was looking to get into WWE developmental. For some reason, they skipped over his run in Wrestling Society X. I know he wasn't on there for long, but I would have liked to hear what he had to say about the experience because it was a televised wrestling show that he probably got paid to be on. So I thought it would have been interesting. Um, but, you know, I guess Steve Austin was like, hey, we can't talk about everything, you know. But I think Wrestling Society X would have been interesting to talk about here. In any event, he wanted to get into a WWE developmental. And um, Joey Mercury was instrumental in helping him do that by... Um, you know, getting him in contact with John Laurinaitis and Dave Lagana was the one who put together his um, his sort of introductory package of photos and highlights and everything. Um, at the same time, he was being courted by TNA. And this is the beginning of his uh, his bit of a schism with Terry Taylor, because Terry Taylor was working in TNA at the time. And they he had verbally agreed to a contract with TNA. And then Jim Cornette found out about that and Cornette <laughs> spazzed on him about signing the TNA and really wanted him not to do it. This was a very interesting piece, too, because he says that, you know, he wouldn't be where he is if w without Jim Cornette. But he does have heat with Jim Cornette for some things that he said about Becky. So, you know, maybe they can, you know, patch it up some other time. But it seems like Cornette doesn't really care about this stuff even though you know he did, should be a little bit more <laughs> a little bit more considerate about people that he's talking about but Cornette was the one who made the appropriate phone calls because he couldn't get John Laurinaitis on the phone and so he was basically like hey look you know I got more money than I've ever made before is being offered to me via TNA and it's already agreed and I've already got you know the contract and everything it's not written it's not paper but we've already verbally agreed to terms. And as he waiting for that contract, the WWE is kind of dicking him around. 
So he's kind of like, whatever. So through Joey Mercury and Jim Cornette, he ends up getting the WWE job. And he, he talked about how much he learned from Cornette and that he was glad that Cornette was in his corner. But as he said, like, you know, these days there is some heat from some stuff with Becky. So he's talked about going to Florida Championship Wrestling and that he expected it to be a big uh, sort of what the performance center are now. That's what he expected it to be. But instead, it was a sweat box in the middle of Tampa. And this is a recurring thing, too. Um, if you've been following the, uh, the 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 series of developmental, especially when we get to uh, <laughs> Deep South and OVW and all these guys, it's, this is where they almost all these guys think that, you know, the WWE is this, you know, it is what it is now. You know, it kind of looks like a college campus, but it used to just be these small uh regional promotions and <clears throat> wrestlers will always be surprised like this is the starting ground and he was one of those guys where he says like hey you know I had to pay my dues and um he talked about how he was frustrated with the drills and he was frustrated with the system because he already knew the business or he believed he already knew the business and WWE because of their recruiting practices they recruit people who don't know anything about wrestling so essentially a lot of it is starting from scratch. And so somebody like him who had already been ring of honor world champion, had already been a top guy somewhere else. He felt like it was completely unnecessary. So you can see the beginning of his ego is what you see with the independent guys today. You know, a lot of these guys feel like oh, I don't need NXT. I don't need this system. I don't need to go through that. And Seth Rollins had that idea too. When he was in FCW, he feel like, Hey, I'm in here with people who are like basketball players you know, amateur wrestlers that have never wrestled pro football players and stuff like that. Why am I in here with these guys? And um, you could, I, I heard about this stuff as it as it occurred. And I know it was a, uh, it was kind of uh, proven through. I think the Shield documentary. He talked a lot about this kind of stuff too. He had like this gigantic ego about being, um, you know, a world champion somewhere else and then being a grunt in WWE. And he felt like he was being downgraded. And so when it moved to the NXT system, he kind of had his uh, come to Jesus moment with Dusty, where he says, Dusty told him, you know, hey, nobody can tell you who you are. Just be yourself. And that contrasted with other messages he were getting. For instance, the most important message that he had gotten was what you did to get here won't make you a success here. And he didn't uh, <laughs> say who said that, but I remember that being Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor told him that. And he's talking about, you know, the difference between independence and WWE. This is what Terry Taylor was trying to tell him. But he was probably telling him in a way that was not the smoothest, most comfortable way of talking to people. You know, these guys are adults and they're talking to adults. But they're also kind of drill sergeants in the same way where they're barking at people. And um, he was saying to himself, like, hey, you had to learn how to do things the WWE way. And, you know, it means... And he toggled with that for a while. and But he had to learn that nobody could tell him what to do in the ring or who he is in the ring. And that is a very important thing that he had to learn. So then we get the, the big issue because he talked about Triple H almost firing him. And essentially, he had this conversation where he said the dusty advice of just be yourself was a double-edged sword. Because he often butted heads with Terry Taylor. And he talked about, you know, conf having so much confidence and maybe too much confidence where he was challenging Terry Taylor in like in front of people in public all the time. And he says the, the infamous words that you hear every independent guy say, wrestling is an art form and, you know, you have to embrace differences and embrace change where Terry was old school. There was a certain style and a certain way of doing things. And this is what they often butted heads about. And this is kind of like the, the the crossroads here where you either prove yourself to be an absolute numbskull and not make it. It's a completely different time, though. This would have been like in 2013, 2014. In today's world, he probably would have just quit and went to AEW or something like that. But back then, there was only WWE. So he had to learn to fit within the system. Now, whenever you see independent guys today... They have that mentality. Oh, they try to change everything. I, I remember TJP talking about that. 
You know, they tried to change everything. They tried to make me do this and told me to do that. And then you see TJP on the independence and he's awful. He's still awful, you know, and it's just, it's just like some guys just have no, no reason to be quote unquote bucking the system. Like if you're trying to help you because you have no charisma and you're just a, a wrestling wrestler guy, you should probably shut the hell up and listen. But in this situation, he wanted to succeed in this profession, in this particular place, to the fact that he needed to learn to give and take. He needed to negotiate that. And he said that Triple H pretty much put him like, hey, this is how our system works. If you want to do this, then this is what you need to do. If you want to do whatever you want, there's the independence. You can do that. And he made a decision that he was going to do things within the WWE system, but he was going to do kind of things his own way. And it is the best way to do it because if you know, like, the Shawn Michaels um, situation where he was sort of like this too. He was kind of zebra-ish in his way where he didn't want to do certain things and he would fight against it. But ultimately, if Vince really pushed him on it, he knew how to do what Vince wanted him to do. And therefore, he knew how to also get what he wanted down the line. And so Seth Rollins had to learn that. You know, he had to learn that give and take and stop fighting the system. He, you know, um, to this point, he said Joey Mercury was the one who kind of prepared him for it. And Joey Mercury told him, like, hey, look, that place is all about compromise. You can't go in there and do whatever you want. They have a certain way of doing things. You may say it's BS. You may say it's stupid or whatever. But if it's working, it's working. So if you want to be there, you have to learn how to compromise on certain things. And Seth did so. And that actually helped him in the future as it was a very important for his success. So he was, of course, picked. He said he volunteered to be sort of the spearhead for the original NXT. That's why he was the first ever NXT champion. And, um, a lot of people forgot that. You know, a lot of people don't remember that he was the first NXT champion. So <laughs> that was that was very interesting that he set the standard for the indie guy being the top guy in NXT. So that was very cool. Of course, they talked uh, extensively about the Shield, um, about the team being put together. And essentially, they weren't really all that close. They weren't really friends, but him and Moxley had great chemistry. Due to having parallel careers on the independence, they kind of knew each other pretty well. Um, and they said Roman, quote, passed the eye test. So that's kind of that's kind of a downgrade for Roman, right? I mean, your only qualification for being in the shield is that you looked apart. <laughs> so in any event, um, Joey Mercury was there to sort of advise them and coach them along. And, you know, hey, this is what you guys need to do. You guys need to be together all the time. He talked about getting a little bit of heat from uh, for being stiff, you know, um, especially with Randy Orton, that he kind of freaked out. But it was Triple H that kind of smoothed that over. Um, he also said that they had to build Romans into the match, which is, you know, Roman moments or moment, <laughs> keep Roman looking strong, that kind of thing. And uh, he said that at, it was at kind of at a certain point where around the time they were about to break up the shield, we say they wanted to break up the shield before. And I've heard this story that they wanted to break up the shield at the Royal Rumble, that they wanted to have uh, the shield turn on each other at Royal Rumble because they wanted to have Ambrose versus Roman at WrestleMania 30. And he wasn't even going to be factored into that. But they banded together and they fought against it. Um, and I remember this conversation because they kind of said, OK, well, at this point, it's the big guy versus the two little guys. And we're just going to get be bounced around for him. So they kind of resisted it and was able to get on the card for WrestleMania 30 and some mis mishmash kind of match, which Seth kind of said, hey, our match got cut because certain people, meaning Steve Austin, went long with their promo and that Triple H went long with his match with um, Daniel Bryan. So they, their match got cut. That's why their match was so short. But um, he said they, they did it for the merch. You know, the merch money, they had an entire run as baby faces, he believed. And that's why that's the key reason why they uh, was able to resist the shield being broken up before WrestleMania. So it wasn't just a they stood in the office and like, no, we're not doing it. They pretty much went in there and made the financial argument that, hey, you know, there's so much money to be made as shield <laughs> with the shield as baby faces. And um, so from there, uh, we learned that they he didn't know about the shield breaking up until I think he says hours before it happened. 
So um, they broke up the shield and he was the guy who was singled out to be the top star. And out of this, he has his revelation. You know, he says Money in the Bank 2014, where he finally figured out what his character meant and what his character was and who he was in the ring as far as what Seth Rollins, who he was and what he was. And that it was um, throughout his entire career, he had never had a character before. And it wasn't until this particular moment he realized what his character was and how he should approach things and how should he should approach his matches and how should he approach his promos. And it matters, you know, to make things matter. And he says that he learned that it's all about the moments. The moments are more important than the matches. And he said this when talking about winning the title at WrestleMania 31. He said that nobody remembered the match. Everybody remembers that moment, though. And that it was hard for him to process, and it was, like, really surreal. And that the cash-in was his idea. When it comes to being sort of an indie guy, some of them have that light bulb that go off. And they're like, oh, I figured it out. And this seems to have been Seth Rollins' time. when He figured it out. Like, this is what they want from me. This is who I am in the ring, as far as from a character perspective. It's not just flips and doodahs anymore. I have something to fall back on. And Steve Austin was like, yes, you know, kind of like nodding. Cause he always nods when guys understand that the character aspect of it. And, um, he tells them like, it's a, uh, it's kind of a, what is it? He says something to fall back on when you kind of lost and you're not sure what to do or what to say, you can always fall back on the character. And that was what Seth Rollins was missing. And he's talked about that, finally figuring that out. So, from there, they talked about his injury, and uh, he felt like the WWE bringing him back as a heel was a mistake, and that he wanted to come back as a babyface. And um, he ended up actually becoming a babyface at WrestleMania 33. But he said that something felt off, that you know, um, because he didn't really like that angle, because Triple H was off TV for so long, and keeping it keeping it around was just him was was a lot of work and a lot of effort, and he felt like it was disconnected. And he also had torn his MCL at the Royal Rumble, but um, he said he was okay. Of course, the Shield reunion in 2017, he really liked that. And he felt like he needed to apologize to the audience for breaking up the Shield. And he thought it was a great character moment. And to be quite honest, I didn't remember it. Um, because these, I remember the, the big Shield reunion, but I didn't remember the build up to it. And they showed the clip of. Just him and Dean Ambrose putting their fists together. And you can see like the crowd reaction. Like people were standing up. And he was right. Like once he started telling the, telling, you know, retelling the story of they spent weeks of these two guys trying to get back together. It's just him and Dean Ambrose. They're trying to get back together. They're trying to make the big apology for breaking up the shield and for stabbing Dean Ambrose in the back. And it's back and forth where one week, you know, Seth puts his fist out. Dean is like, no. Then the next week, Dean puts his fist out and Seth's like, no. And then finally they get on the same page and the crowd absolutely erupts. I don't even know what they were doing in 2017. I don't remember. <laughs> but I do remember now, they, you know, that they talked about it. The Big Shield reunion. And uh, it didn't last very long, of course. But it was it's great that people do remember these big moments and they, he, they are thinking about it in terms of what is good for the character. And Seth Rollins talked about him being a baby face. There was still a section of the audience who didn't like him because of that, you know, that he was the guy who broke up the shield and they never got any kind of catharsis from it. But now he felt like he had done that, that he had given the people the catharsis of apologizing for the shield and being a baby face. And he thought that would change things. Of course it didn't. But in uh, mem you know, reminiscing on the Shield, he says, "Hey, this is the greatest faction because you got three guys who, three guys who became the top guys, and there were no quote no Genetis, and they, unlike the Four Horsemen, like when Ric Flair was the top guy, he said there was this was three Ric Flairs, and you know, I felt like, of course, you know, <laughs> don't be let's not get too delusional about the <laughs> the the top guy thing, but." All three of these guys are legit. 
you know, Tyler Black, a.k.a. Seth Rollins, was a world champion before he came to WWE with Ring of Honor. Uh, John Moxley was a world champion in AEW, um, is the current GCW world champion. Of course, Roman Reigns at the top of the business right now. So it's like you can make the argument that, you know, it's one of the greatest factions as far as making guys top stars. Of course, it doesn't have the longevity of the four horsemen and, you know, the, the name value of the NWO or DX or anything like that. And I think in modern WWE history, modern pro wrestling history, it is one of the best best factions ever. You know, you have to say the same thing for the New Day. But I think the, the qualifications are a little bit different today than it used to be. So, of course, he talked about, you know, despite the fact that he thought that would get him over with the fans, it didn't really, you know, the bringing the shield back. It didn't really get him over. So he says that he was started having problems with Vince. Because Vince would challenge him and say, what happened to him? Where is he? Where, what, what happened to Seth freaking Rollins? And he sort of blamed Vince's booking for him, what happened to Seth freaking Rollins. And then he says that, hey, you know, I haven't been given the ball. You haven't really given me the shot because, you know, you had me stuck in this position where I was the heel when everybody wanted to cheer me. And now people want to boo me and I'm the baby face. So you have to, you know, give me the ball and let me run with it. And they decided to do this via the Intercontinental Championship where he had this epic Intercontinental title run. And then, of course, right here, he talks about a lot about his relationship with Vince and that, you know, learning, quote, learning the game and building that relationship with Vince because you can't stick around in WWE all this time without having some sort of relationship with Vince. And that Vince respects him and he respects him. They respect each other. Let's put it like that. Because he's willing to stand up for himself. He's not going to let Vince kind of, you know, dominate all over him. He has this you know, has a sense of who he is and what he is and wanting the opportunities and felt like he wasn't getting them and wanted to use the Intercontinental Championship as a way of getting back in the good graces of the fans. And it ended up working for, I think, for the most part. Of course, it didn't last long, though. <laughs> but he, of course, worked, talked about working with Brock at WrestleMania 35. Um, earning Brock's respect was an important thing, and he said he was able to do that through beer. Uh, and Brock likes Coors Lights. <laughs> so... Um, and he says that, you know, he had to learn another thing from Brock. And that is that, uh, uh, falling back on the, the, the old moments are more important than matches. He talked about battleground 2015. He went to Brock with all of these ideas and Brock was being very grumpy because he says undertaker's coming back. Nobody cares about this shit. Essentially, nobody's going to remember this match. Nobody's going to care about this match. Save whatever you got in your head, save it. Because just let's just go out there, tell a little bit of a story. Undertaker's going to show up. Everybody's going to remember that. Everybody's going to be talking about that. So, you know, let's keep it simple so that we can get the match was just a means to an end. The match just kind of has to happen. But the big angle is Brock and Undertaker going forward. And he said, like, he thought that from that conversation, Brock didn't really want to work with him. But the, what he learned is that just, just how Brock thinks like you know when he was told about the angle the undertaker's coming out he sort of dumped the match out of his mind and said okay well, now we need to focus on this undertaker angle because this is what we're doing going forward and you know he was able to bribe brock with Coors light at wrestlemania to working with him which was which was really funny and he also talked and I, i'm glad that he mentioned this that he actually expected to be the main event of wrestlemania 35 and he was in a in a weird space when uh, he was told that Becky Lynch was going to get the spot because he said like, Hey, you know, she was at the top of the business at the time and I was proud of her, but I wanted that spot. You know, I, he felt that it should have been his spot and it's, it's a weird position to put a guy in. And it, of course it got even weirder as they booked him to be Becky Lynch's purse holder after WrestleMania 35. And they they kind of, they kind of, <laughs> they kind of wish washed over that one. Kind of like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really like it. We should have kept that separate. But that's that did a lot of damage to Seth Rollins too. Is that whole the man's man? Oh God, ugh, ugh. I, I have no problem saying that Seth Rollins is one of my favorite wrestlers up until that point. Until they started doing the man's man, I was like, no, mm -mm. <laughs> no, that sucked. That sucked. And he, but it was, it led to some interesting things like the mixed tag team match with uh, Baron Corbin and Lacey Evans, which I liked. I liked that match. I liked the idea. I liked the dynamic that was going on there. But that whole the man's man era was awful. And that is, you know, the bad part 
of being a racehorse is, you know, you get trapped in these real, some real terrible stuff like that whole, the man's man thing, like the whole thing with the fiend. And, you know, that stuff is not good. It is not good. Being in the, that's the thing, like working in the WWE system, it's the most successful system that has ever been put together in pro wrestling. At the same time, it also, it just as it produces some of the best moments ever, it also produces some of the worst. And it does, in some cases, completely embarrass guys. Or, you know, and this was a time where you had to, you know, it's a, again, it's a double-edged sword. For, yeah, you got to beat Brock at WrestleMania. That's great. Now we want you to hold Becky's purse for three months. Like, no, this is not what I, ain't what I had planned, you know, as being a top guy was to get overshadowed by my, by my wife, my fiance. This sucks. So the Becky Lynch, uh, run when he was essentially the purse holder for Becky Lynch, um, and the, the run of matches with the fiend, he says that it kind of did some damage to the character and he felt like there wasn't enough heels lined up to give him a good run. They, they didn't do a good job there. He kind of blamed creative in it, you know, which made sense because th that's always the big part of the top baby face. And they mentioned that here is that, you know, for the baby face, the, the money is in the chase. It's not really in the maintenance, you know, even though WWE as a promotion is all, is a baby face promotion in so much that it had a top baby face where other promotions often had top heels, you know, uh, or as far as the champion is concerned, right? Everybody had a top baby face. What I'm saying is a baby face as the number one star in the promotion, Bruno, Hogan, Backlund, you know, Cena, th that kind of thing. And he says he kind of felt like they didn't, there wasn't enough heels there to put him on that level, but there was also the creative, you know, splotches like the fiend, like the, the, the angle with Becky Lynch. And he said, but he credits the feud with the fiend for creating the Messiah, which is the character he, he really liked and that he was able to explain the Messiah and be able to, he, he felt it and he started doing research for it. And that was when he really fully sort of went into the idea of being a character and he's, he was able to explain it like, and it's kind of weird that these things do make sense when you sit down and think about them. And he talked about the Messiah and he says that the Messiah is based off of, uh, you know, obviously televangelists, ministers, pastors, stuff like that, which I, if you followed this channel, you know that I, I've already said that, but he said that it was basically real life because he had a vision for the industry and it goes back to where he was talking with Terry Taylor in NXT that he just, there were certain things, certain things he wanted to do with the industry. And he incorporated sort of those, that mentality, not exactly his philosophy, but that mentality into the Messiah, you know, the, the idea that he has, that only he has the truest vision for the industry. This is a, almost this megalomaniacal concept. And the, the Messiah is the underpinning, the foundation for what he is today, what they call the drip God. And he says that, you know, in coming up with this new character, you know, which is not really new, it's an extension of the Messiah. It's just a little bit different. And he said that he, from this perspective, he wanted to be more entertainment. He wanted to be the guy who could laugh. You could laugh at him and laugh with him. And he wanted to be more Ric Flair. He wanted to have more pizzazz. He wanted to have more pop. So he came up with the ideas for the suits. And the suits came from Becky Lynch, you know, her stylist is the one who hooked him up with all these crazy, goofy suits he wears. And um, he says that he defines the character of the drip God, quote unquote, as the Messiah who has lost his mind. And from this point, he says that he doesn't even think about playing a character anymore. He has become the character to the point where if, you know, what, how do they put it? If you're thinking, you're stinking. He doesn't think about it anymore. He just becomes the character. So that was like, you could tell from the beginnings, you know, he had this, this mentality compared that to where he began to where it is now. And, you know, a lot of people hate when folks are, you know, I don't know how else to put it, but put themselves into the system. And they, Daniel Bryan was one of these guys. I think it was a couple, was it earlier this year, actually, 
where Brian Danielson kept talking about, yeah, hey, I want to wrestle these guys. I want to wrestle these guys. And you will see internet wrestling fans would yell, shut up, have the balls to leave. And you need to stop talking about dream matches that you want to have unless you're going to do it. And it's that, that bitterness, that almost that rejection that you have from the independent, quote unquote, independent wrestling fans towards people who go into the WWE system, they fit or find a way to fit and they become successful. A lot of that is aimed towards Seth Rollins now, you know, because he's willing to stand on what he says as far as being the best wrestler or being the best wrestling company or whatever the case may be, even if you disagree with it, he's willing to, to stand on it and go there and not consider you know, going back to what he what he was doing in the independence because he's far more successful now than he was then. And changing his mentality and changing his motivations and different things like that has led to his success today. But considering there's a lot of people out there who don't really want they what they want is I think I said it before, what they want is what they had previously. It's like there is a vehement hatred for Seth Rollins. But nobody seems to have a problem. If he was to just show up as plain Jane Tyler Black, people would be like, oh, okay, sweet, cool. I love Tyler Black. But they hate Seth Rollins. It's the same guy, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a different mentality that goes into it. And he seems to have mastered it or figured it out. And I'm very proud of him because he's only, he's only like 34 or 35 or something like that. So he still has a little ways to go. As far as how much time he got left in the business. So this ought to be fun. And he says his main goal now is to main event WrestleMania. He wants to be on the marquee for WrestleMania. He's still young enough to do it. You know. So I believe he will main event WrestleMania one day. Is it going to be anytime soon? I don't know. Don't know. But I think it will happen. But I think this is really good. As far as telling people. Having an independent star. Who would have been in AEW had it had it existed when he was coming into WWE, um, and finding his way into the system and it worked and found how he could succeed. It is very important for other people who are looking to make that jump themselves. For some of the people who are already in NXT, you know, if you're uh, a young wrestler like a Blake Christian or, or a um, what's the what's the young black dude name? His name is Carmelo Hayes in NXT. But he spent a lot of time on the independence. You know, if you're a guy like that, somebody like Seth Rollins is like a, a great mentor for you. If you go into the WWE system, but you're used to doing things outside that system. While AEW is more accepting of you don't have to change. You could do whatever you want. WWE forces change. It demands you to leave your comfort zone. And some there needs to be people within WWE that can say, yeah, the system works, you know, to a degree. It ain't perfect. and Nothing's going to be perfect. But if you learn how to work within the system, you learn how to work characters and personalities and different things like that, it can work. And that is very important. All right. So that's what I learned from Broken Skull Sessions. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, donate to the channel. Thank you guys for your time. And I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.